The British Army. To an outsider, it looks like one single fighting force. In reality, it's divided into more than 40 independent regiments, each with its own culture and traditions. And if you want to understand the British Army, these regiments are the best place to start. In this program, we meet one of the oldest regiments in the British Army. There will be more than two billion people watching this. There is absolutely no scope for any sort of cock-up. Their ceremonial uniform is famous around the world. I was taught in training that if, uh, if it's uncomfortable, you're doing it right, because nothing's comfortable in the army. But first and foremost, they're a unit of fighting soldiers. Well, I'm fighting the officer, so it shouldn't be too hard. He's used to drinking pim, so I'm just going to knock him out, hopefully. A regiment's history is what you fight for. And if you look at what the regiment has achieved since its birth, the regiment has been involved in, in everything. This is a regiment that was formed to fight against the monarchy. Now, it's a bodyguard to the Queen. The Cold Stream Guards. The Coldstream Guards are famous for their red coats, bare skins, and shiny boots. Looking this good takes a lot of beeswax. The beeswax is absorbed into the leather and then it just hardens, makes, them, makes the boots solid, so then it will hold the polish. Makes it a bit uncomfortable, but without the wax, you won't get the same desired effect, you won't get the shine. You know, a decent pair of boots that have been worn a fair few times, you're looking at hours and hours of work, if not maybe days of work gone into them. It is something you, you know, get quite proud of. And it isn't just the boots that require a lot of attention. I'm washing my bare skin and working all the shampooing like you would. It's like washing any normal sort of hair, really. I'm not used to washing long hair, but I'd probably wash it every month, if not probably a bit more often, just to keep it looking nicer. But it's just to let it dry upside down and that's... Your best gonna dry, and that's done. The Coldstream Guards are one of five regiments that serve as ceremonial foot guards to the Queen. The changing of the guard has become famous around the world. It's so surreal, marching down the streets. <laughs> and all the tourists there watching you. I'm just thinking, I've seen people do this so many times and never imagined that it would be me doing it. <laughs> and I was so nervous the first time I did it as well. As one of the junior officers, Lieutenant Scarlett is responsible for carrying the regimental colors. Historically, colours were used on the battlefield to show where certain units of men were. You know, I mean, I'm a small, I'm a small man. The colour, the colour pike is probably at least a third bigger than me. <laughs> so I'm walking down the streets of London holding something which is pretty massive for a small man like me, um, trying to move it around and, and not fall over and not, um, <laughs> not look like an idiot. Every soldier in the Coldstream Guards will spend at least six months with the regiment's ceremonial company in London. But most of their time is spent in the Light Infantry Battalion in Aldershot. The regiment is made up of over 800 men, led by 77 officers. In 2010, the Coldstream Guards were deployed to a volatile area of Helmand in Afghanistan. Make sure you're moving the distance to the f around here. They saw regular action against the Taliban and suffered five fatalities. Peeling, peeling. The Coldstreamers were awarded four military crosses for bravery, 
more than any other regiment on their tour of duty. Come on, fellas. This was the latest honour for a regiment whose roots and traditions reach back over 350 years. Run fast! The Coldstream Guards were born out of the English Civil War. In 1649, King Charles I was executed. Oliver Cromwell soon took control of the country. But his rule was fragile. The Royalist cause still had strong support, especially in Scotland. In 1650, Cromwell created a new regiment to challenge Royalist forces north of the border. The regiment was based in the northernmost town in England, Berwick-upon-Tweed. In those days, there wasn't a barracks. They had to billet in houses around the community, uh, perhaps camp uh, outside the walls. And they were also asked to build a new church for the community, and the church of which I'm now very proud to be vicar. As well as being a vicar, Alan Hughes is also a veteran of the Coldstream Guards. There's an old saying that once a Coldstreamer always a co-streamer and it's almost 50 years since I joined the regiment but I'm wearing co-stream cufflinks, I'm wearing a brigade of guards pocket handkerchief left by an old general friend I buried. It's a little like having a stick of rock with something running all the way through. I think being a co-streamer it rather runs through you. The regiment's first commanding officer was General George Monk. Monk had been in prison for fighting on the side of the Royalists during the Civil War. While in the Tower of London, he wrote a book on military strategy that impressed Cromwell. He was released on condition that he switched allegiance to Cromwell and his parliamentarian cause. This is General George Monk, who is a bit of a hero of his time. He was a bit of a colossal man, rather tall, rather plump for his time. Um, and had a farming background, but, but a fantastic soldier. Um, there's been a, a hundred books written about famous generals, and more often than not, General Monk is, is the first one that people write about. Monk's regiment became part of the first professional fighting force in British history, Cromwell's new model army. Known as Monk's Regiment of Foot, the new force saw action within two weeks of its formation. In September 1650, it fought alongside Cromwell himself at the Battle of Dunbar, where they routed a Royalist army. Over the next decade, Monk's regiment continued the campaign against Royalist forces in Scotland. Monk was becoming one of the most powerful men in the country. When Oliver Cromwell died in 1658, rival army factions started vying for power. The country was sliding back towards civil war. Monk was determined to restore order. In January 1660, he set off for London with 6,000 soldiers. The march began in the village of Coldstream. I'm standing now on the northern bank of the River Tweed in Coldstream in the Scottish borders. And I'm standing beside um, a crossing point, a ford, no bridge in the time of the regiment. And what we're told is that in that January, they set off into these icy waters and headed south. Amazing men, so tough. In January 2010, a company of Coldstream guards celebrated the 350th anniversary of Monk's Long March by retracing the 425 mile route. It took us uh, 26 days. Extremely hard work on the men. That, that's kind of road mileage, pounds away on knees and ankles and, and, and the soles of the, the boots themselves. So we went through a few pairs of boots, of course, some pretty impressive blisters. Monk's weather and our weather was extremely similar. There's a document that says that uh, Monk didn't see bare earth between Berwick and London. So we started in the snow, horrific snow, and we finished with a light drizzling of snow, so that was quite nice. 
As Monk traveled south, he was able to gauge the mood of the country. Parliament was seen as ineffective and out of touch. When he arrived in London with his force of 6,000 men, he delivered a warning to the House of Commons. As I marched from Scotland hither, I observed the people in most counties. The chiefest of their desires were for a full and free Parliament. Monk finished with a threat. If any different counsels should be taken, these nations would be thrown back into force and violence. Within a month, Parliament was dissolved. Elections followed. One of the first acts of the new Parliament was the restoration of the monarchy. Cromwell's new model army was disbanded, but Monk's regiment of foot was spared. On the 14th of February, 1661, the regiment assembled at Tower Hill. They ceremonially laid down their arms as Republican soldiers and raised them again as soldiers of the King. They've served the monarchy ever since. General Monk was given the Garter Star, which is the highest award that you can give to any military or any civilian, really. And we wear it on our, our regimental headdress every day. So it's a very proud thing to wear. When General Monk died in 1670, Monk's Regiment of Foot was renamed the Coldstream Regiment of Foot Guards in honor of the march that helped restore the monarchy. Monk's chaplain, Thomas Gumbel, recorded the occasion. The town of Coldstream, because the general did it the honor to make it the place of his residence for some time, hath given title to a small company of men whom God hath made instruments of great things. A regiment's history, be it the Colchian Guards or any other, is what you fight for. You fight knowing that your regiment hasn't failed before you, so you almost put yourself under pressure knowing that the regiment has a very proud history and you've got to live up to those expectations. April the 27th, 2011. Two days to go before the royal wedding. This morning we're doing early morning rehearsal. Uh, everybody's been, been up and about since about half past two uh, for briefing at four o'clock and, uh, and then on the road at five. And the reason it's early morning is because the roads are quiet and empty and we can have the place to ourselves without causing too much disruption to the general public. And it's our one opportunity to run through it with everybody uh, who's going to be on parade taking part. The Coldstream Guards will be one of the regiments lining the route of the royal procession along the Mall. Ceremonial drill harks back to the days when we fought on foot in lines and squares. Of course it doesn't have any particular point in, in, in battles now. We'd, I suspect, be equally good soldiers if we didn't polish our boots to a high sheen, march very smartly. But that is the way in which we demonstrate outwardly uh, the pride we have in the job that we do and in the monarch that we serve. You know, there is no finer uh, or sterner critic than Her Majesty when it comes to ceremonial drill. Um, and we don't want to be found wanting alongside the other regiments. Coldstream Guards are on a training exercise in France. Their mission, to take control of a small town that's been overrun by insurgents. They're in the building. How many's there? Woods. <laughs> They're on a joint exercise with a French infantry company and their armoured support. The French have just gone over with their armour. It's part of a new defence cooperation agreement signed by the two countries in 2010. It even extends to the sharing of ration packs. There's some things that are better in the French and some things that are better in the British. So. The way that we've been able to coordinate working with the French has been really excellent. The French commander came in. He was very happy. I just said, look, what do you want from us? This is what we can give you. 
and it worked. There is a language barrier, of course. Uh, I have to say the French speak English better than we speak French, uh, which I'm sure is to our, you know, to our shame. But we're talking about fundamental skills that are the same whether you're a French soldier or a British soldier. So there is an innate level of understanding anyway about the way that we need to do our business. The Coldstream Guard's relationship with the French hasn't always been so collaborative. One of the regiment's defining moments was at the Battle of Waterloo. It was to be the climax of over 20 years of conflict in Europe. On the 18th of June, 1815, British forces lined up alongside their European allies under the command of the Duke of Wellington. Across the battlefield was Napoleon's imperial army. The future of Europe hung in the balance. The Coldstream Guards were given a vital role to defend the Chateau of Hugomont on the western flank of the battlefield. If it were to fall, Wellington's right flank would be dangerously exposed. The Battle of Waterloo began with a French assault on Hugomont at about 11.30 a.m. From this moment, the chateau would be under constant attack. Today, some of the cold streamers have come to the scene of the battle. So this would be, I suppose, the first view that the, um, the French would have had. The Wellington committed three and a half thousand troops to hold Hugomont. Over the course of the day, they would be attacked by 14,000 Frenchmen. Soon after midday, a group of French infantry launched a surprise attack at the North Gate. The French Lieutenant Le Gros, the enforcer, who's known, huge man, comes at the gates with an axe and hacks his way through uh, the wooden bar securing the gate, and breaks in with 40 odd Frenchmen. Panic in the, uh, in the courtyard here and for a few minutes everything looks pretty awful and the French have got the courtyard here and that's the point where it could all go horribly wrong. Aware that the whole battle could be lost if Hugomont fell to the French, the Coldstream Guard's commanding officer, Lieutenant Colonel James MacDonnell, charged to the gates. Private Matthew Clay was in the courtyard. I saw MacDonnell carrying a large piece of wood or trunk of a tree in his arms, with which he was hastening to secure the gates against the renewed attack of the enemy. MacDonnell forced the gates shut against the enemy. The cold streamers now turned on the French soldiers who'd fought their way into the courtyard. It came down to man on man and a sort of fighting that we will hopefully never experience because it's, you know, we're talking cold steel, rifle butts, all very close in. Um, you know, in Afghanistan, you never see the enemy, do you? 300 yards away, if you're lucky, whereas here, it's hand-to-hand -hand fighting, yeah. and it's nothing but. And all the French who got in here were slaughtered. And the only Frenchman that was spared was the drummer boy, who was 11, 12 years old. The French assault on the chateau continued, but the Coldstream guards held their position until Napoleon was defeated. Defending Hugomont cost Wellington 1,500 men. The French lost up to 5,000. The Duke of Wellington later said that the success of the Battle of Waterloo turned on the closing of the gates at Hugomont. And he described Lieutenant Colonel Macdonnell as the bravest man at Waterloo. Those soldiers, how can you describe them? They're probably not some of the bravest people you'd ever meet. The bravery shown by these men, you know, must have, well, not must have, was second to none. Hugomont. It's impossible to describe just how important it is to us. You know, it's funny, here we are, 
you know, 300 yards from a motorway. You can hear the traffic, and it's and yet it's what made our regiment's name. At the Coldstream Guards Barracks in Aldershot, the regiment's success at Hugomont is still commemorated every year. The celebrations feature a brick that was brought home from the site of the battle. Here is the original brick from Hugomont Farm, which is hung above the bar in December, one day of the year, uh, and anybody who touched that brick is then required to provide the beverage for the rest of that day. <laughs> Often the junior officers shy away from being invited to touch a brick, so it's usually them being crowd surfed towards a bar and then whatever means possible for them to touch a brick, which is usually head first, unfortunately, for them. In the sergeant's mess, the record of the regiment's history comes right up to date. In terms of modern history, you know, this is a piece we brought back from Afghanistan last year. So this was taken from Taliban insurgents. who tried to make their escape good on, on this motorcycle um, when they were uh, arrested. And we managed to keep hold of this motorcycle and it's on proud display now in the sergeant's mess. It doesn't work. It would be dangerous for it to work because mixing this motorcycle with um, happy hours on a Friday afternoon would just cause lots and lots of trouble for me. So it doesn't work at all. The battalion returned from Afghanistan in May last year um, and unfortunately we had uh, five fatalities, one of whom was a sergeant's mess member, um, John Aimer. We've got um, a nice sketch drawing of him there um, and clearly of him in action also and, and unfortunately of his funeral and we, we often remember Sergeant Christopher Hickey, um, Tricky, who was killed in action in, uh, in Iraq on the 18th of October in 2005 on his last patrol of that tour, uh, just prior to when he was due to, to um, fly back to the UK. When a soldier's killed in the battalion, it really hits the battalion hard. And it, whilst we're away on operations, there, there is a small amount of time to, to bereave, but then you've got to move on really quickly and get on with the job in hand. The time to really uh, remember and bereave is on the return to, to the UK. It's, it's particularly hard because these people are not just colleagues, these people have been friends and more than friends for, for many years and my family and everybody else's family interacts on a regular basis. So it's, it's, it's much more personal than just being colleagues. It's actually, the Colson Guards is, is a real family. Tonight, the cold streamers have gathered for an intercompany boxing tournament. Guardsman Billy Robinson, wearing blue, served in Afghanistan last year. He was injured when a roadside bomb exploded within meters of where he was standing. His friend was killed. I enjoyed the sport, especially after Afghan. We had a hard time out there. Uh, and it's one of those sports that gets you team building again, even though you're hitting each other and training with each other. You still got that bond, and yeah, it's good. Guardsman Robinson has been beaten by an officer. But the junior ranks have another chance with Lance Sergeant Anthony Bull. I'm fighting the officer's mess, so it shouldn't be too hard. He's used to drinking pim, so I'm just going to knock him out, hopefully. <laughs> Boxing's almost like the epitome of everything that a soldier should be. You need to be courageous and it takes a lot of courage to get into the ring. Stand against your opponent that you can see two metres in front of you and fight the guy. It's everything that a soldier needs to be is embodied in this sport. It's the officer's night. Lance Sergeant Bull has also lost. I haven't seen two officers fight in the third division before. Uh, I think that shows great character. 
Uh, well done to both of you for winning. Um, but I think that also shows. <laughs> <laughs> I can hear the audience for winning you for a bit. No, it does. It shows the character of the Italian, and I think that's fantastic. So, well done, the boxers. Put that on first. Okay, yeah. Don't worry about that other thing. It's back around with that. It's the day of the royal wedding. Last minute preparations are underway. What will happen now is I'll get my mate to uh, brush me down. So I've got no fluff, no white fluff or anything on there. Guardsman Tom Carlin has recently completed basic army training. Today will be the first time he's performed ceremonial duties. This is the first big thing we uh, got here two weeks ago. So it's passing off at Catterick to a, uh, a royal wedding. Quite proud to be part of it, to be fair. All in all, I was doing these for maybe an hour, hour and a half, the day before yesterday. Uh, as you probably see, my left foot's quite tight, so I can't even wear a sock. That's why I bandaged it. Double check the tweed to the right then, probably a little bit of adjustment. You stand at attention, obviously this one sits on the, the second lace. That's good. Okay. Starting to get a little bit nervous now, yeah, so as all the kit's going on. Starts to get a little bit warmer. Hot. Sweaty. I was always taught in training that if, uh, if it's uncomfortable, you're doing it right, because nothing's comfortable in the army. It's got heat. Yes, sir. It's got running. Yes, sir. There will be more than two billion people watching this on television around the world. There is absolutely no scope for mistakes, loss of concentration, any sort of cock up. And we will be smarter than any other formed body of men out there today. For 360 years, the Coldstream Guards have been at the heart of British life. Today, they're on parade at a royal ceremony, watched across the world. For the soldiers, it's a once-in-a-lifetime experience. For the regiment, it's one more day in a long and eventful history. We are a very small part of a rather large beast. Nobody is bigger than the regiment we serve. Um, and I think it does us all well to remember that from time to time. I feel as if I'm part of something that has been going on for an awfully long time before I came along. And hopefully will be going on for an awfully long time after I've left and died.